Well, my experience with Casablanca really began at two years old because my aunt had sent a box of 45s and one of them was the 45 of YMCA by Village People. And that's the only one that I remember all these years later, but there was something about listening to that song and watching the label art spin around, the Casablanca logo spin around, that really just fed my imagination. And if you, if you look at the logo and you see these gates that go into this magical city, I always wondered, well, what's inside there? You know, it's like this beautiful purplish background and out front you see these camels and these palm trees and I thought, that's a place I want to go to. Does it really exist? So it really just fed my imagination. And so hearing that song and, and watching it spin around entertained me for hours on end. And when a few years later we got the Flashdance soundtrack, I saw a bigger version of the Casablanca logo because it was a full record. And that just changed it all. The reason I decided to write about Casablanca was back in January, Pop Matters put together um, the 50th anniversary of Motown, which I had a hand in putting together. And Motown was the first label that I ever had any sort of visual association with. And Casablanca was the second. So d doing the Motown anniversary made me think about Casablanca. And then I realized, well, man, it's been 35 years since that debut album by Kiss was released. And 35 is as good an anniversary as any. So I thought, well, let's, let's take this on. Because really, I've been doing a lot of interviews and a lot of reviews, but I'd never approached something so big. And it was really a challenge to, a, a good challenge to write kind of an oral history about something. And I think out of all of the labels that I grew up with, Casablanca, I have the most sentimental attachment to but also the most interest in researching and sort of making other people appreciate what came out of that. Because I learned so much that I had never knew about Casablanca just in the past five months putting this together. I'm just interested in telling people's stories, you know, no matter what kind of artist. I think that every artist has such a different career trajectory that you can never run out of interesting material and looking at the history of Casablanca and all the artists that came through there there are so many aspects to it that really a lot of people don't know or have forgotten or don't really consider as being valuable but to me in doing research I found it incredibly rich mm. and so for me as a writer and someone who has interviewed many artists previously, it was such a gratifying experience to tackle something that is so multifaceted. What made Casablanca stand out as a record company in the 70s and even now today, mm -hmm. in my opinion, because it was able to bring together all of these different genres. It had rock, disco, funk, jazz, country, comedy, singer-songwriter, pop, soundtracks. It was just so rich with different styles and different artists and different producers that I don't know if labels really represent that anymore, mm -hmm. that diversity mm -hmm. of, of style. When I think about Casablanca and I think about the creativity that sprouted from that label. I really think about Neil Bogart who founded the label and the kind of enthusiasm and creativity that he brought to his work really was expressed through all of the different acts that he signed because he was just a music maven. If you, if you look, especially in the early days, if you look at the kinds of acts that he signed, he had such an interesting ear for what could work. Mm -hmm. He signed Kiss, he signed Parliament Funkadelic, he signed Fanny, he signed Greg Perry, he signed Peter Noon. I mean, like such an interesting array of, of acts that, you know, maybe other labels wouldn't have given a chance. But really, he was willing to take a chance on, on different sounds and 
and really cultivate the careers of artists who might have had difficulty elsewhere because they were so outside of the conventional musical form. Wow. The most gratifying part of, of writing Casablanca, play it again, really, was just speaking to all of the artists, and especially the artists that maybe didn't get their due the first time around, and artists that I am just discovering. Um, there's a group called Platypus, and they were a progressive rock slash R&B band that by the time they got to Casablanca had this great disco song called Dancing in the Moonlight that I discovered online like two years ago and was just determined to find the song, you know, and I couldn't find it anywhere. And I really think that kind of passion, like wanting to find a song that is unavailable, is really what fed my energy into putting this together because I want people to discover music that they haven't heard before and I want these artists to feel that their music can still be appreciated even if it didn't go gold, even if they didn't have a number one hit, even if they had to break up <laughs> after their one album because the industry was going in a downward spiral at the end of the 70s and they were dropped. So groups like Platypus, groups like Seventh Wonder, artists like Gloria Scott and Greg Perry, these are people that I've really developed a fondness for in doing this project and I, I really hope that they're given their due in some way, shape or form. So that really truly was the most gratifying experience. In addition to speaking to Larry Blackman and Tommy Jenkins from Cameo and Donna Summer and Giorgio Moroder, I mean, come on, that's just incredible. But I think more than anything just to give a voice to artists that haven't been heard from in many, many years. After people finish reading Casablanca Play It Again, I really would like them to walk away with an appreciation for the music, first and foremost, because that's really where I came from in terms of my relationship to the history of the company, was the music. and. If they are interested in going to YouTube to hearing some old clips, if they're interested in trying to track down an old vinyl somewhere, or of the remaining CD stores that are out there, even going to try to find... You know, some people may not have heard Donna Summer's early stuff, so, you know, go out and get it by all means. But really it's the music that I want people to appreciate. And, and from the industry standpoint, I would love for this music to find a place out there again in, in an accessible way so that people don't have to go digging in places that are impossible to find a lot of a lot of this music because it just hasn't been heard in more than 30 years. The companies haven't really capitalized on the catalog and I, and I really really hope that after this 35th year passes the powers will take it upon themselves to really listen to what they have and put it out there for people my age and younger to to appreciate and to just you know groove to have a good time with Casablanca play it again was truly a labor of love and I don't think there's ever been a project that I've been so passionately invested in getting it done seeing it through I really hope that people will just take the time to check it out. It's going to be published on popmatters.com, just type that in, at P-O-P-M-A-T-T-E-R-S.com, and that will probably be up the last week in July, and it will hopefully run over different days because it's a fairly long article, but something you can print out, take with you to the beach, take with you on the airplane, on the train, and just spend some time at the Casbah.